How should we understand from the most Olympian perspective, from indeed a super Olympian perspective, the process of economic growth that the human race has undergone, um, that humanity has undertaken? To get a sense roughly of the magnitudes of humanity's participation in the economic growth process. Um, let us start by looking at an index of the value of the stock of useful ideas about manipulating nature and organizing humans that have been discovered, invented, and deployed over the globe throughout the ages. Um, because, after all, it is the ideas that we have about how to organize ourselves and how to manipulate nature that are the ultimate drivers of economic growth. Let us set that index so that a 1% increase in real productivity and standards of living on average worldwide, holding human populations constant, um, is a 1% increase in the index. Why 1%? Think of that as a normalization. Other things equal, we'd like to say that a society twice as rich without differences in resources per capita or per worker must have twice the value of the stock of useful ideas that it has managed to deploy. And also set that index so that a 1% increase in population holding productivity and living standards constant is a 1.5% increase in the index. Um, why one half percent? Well, if it were one, then you would be judging that human labor is worthless, that the same increase in ideas is necessary to support one percent more population at the same standard of living as to support the same population at a one percent higher standard of living. That could not possibly be right. Each mouth comes with four limbs, ten fingers, two eyes, and a brain attached. And if it were to be a number much smaller than one-half, say one-fifth, then you would be judging that um, natural resources are unimportant, that it really does not matter much for output per worker if farm sizes are much smaller, and that also cannot be right. That cannot be right either in the past, in which we were mostly farmers, and in which farm size was key, or even in the late 20th century, when we got to see how much the global economy depended on cheap oil. Now let's look at the growth rate um, of this index of ours. We estimate pretty well that the human population right now is about 7.6 billion, with a total world real income of perhaps 90 trillion a year. That tells us that average real income per capita today is just a hair under $12,000 per year. We are confident that a century and a half ago, back in 1870, the total human population was only 1.3 billion. And we are also semi-confident that the average real income per capita then, um, that it was no more than $1,300 a year, that it was only about one-eleventh of what we have now. Now, I say semi-confident because there are grave conceptual difficulties involved in calculating such a number. So much of what we produce today could not have been produced at any price back then. $1,300 is about the value today of what they did produce, but if we had $1,300 a day, we would spend a large chunk of it on things they could not produce at all. And these numbers make no allowance for that. Um, that if we gave them their income now, they would spend it very differently and presumably be significantly happier. From $1,300 per capita 150 years ago to a hair under 12000 today is a rate of productivity, um, or rather let's call it a rate of efficiency of labor growth, because it's ideas making labor more efficient that are ultimately decisive, of about 1.5% per year. From 1.3 to 7.6 billion people is a rate of population and labor force increase of 1.2% per year. Add the first to half the second and get an imputed growth rate over the past century and a half of 2.06% per year 
for the growth rate, for the proportional growth rate of our index of the value of the stock of useful human ideas about technology and organization that we have discovered, invented, and deployed. Parenthetically, what's the future likely to bring? We can see from the nearly completed demographic transition to low fertility that the world is likely to stabilize at a population of 9 billion in this century. As a baseline case, suppose we maintain our pace of ideas growth, the pace we've had for the past century and a half for another century, then the world in 2100, um, it would have an average real income per capita of not $12,000 per year, but more like $50,000 per year. That's the typical lifestyle equivalent of the, that scene in the global north today. And the world would be, in this aspect at least, for the first time, a truly human world. But I don't want to look any further in the future, I want to look further back in the past. What was going on before 1870? Well, a century earlier, in 1770, we estimate pretty well that the total human population was about 750 million or so. And we know that that part of the world that was to become the global north, it experienced substantial but not overwhelming growth in living standards and efficiency of labor, while the world outside the charmed circle of that affected by the British Industrial Revolution over the century 1770 to 1870, that saw little progress. Taking the approximate average gives us a growth rate of 0.17% per year for efficiency of labor growth worldwide over the British Industrial Revolution century, and of 0.55% per year in population. Taking the first plus half the second gives us 0.44% per year for the proportional growth rate of the ideas stock. That's less than a quarter as much as we have been used to for the past 150 years. For the past 150 years, we have had more than four times the proportional rate of growth of useful ideas and human technological and organizational competence than humanity had in the British Industrial Revolution century. And before 1770, um, well, then we see the commercial imperial age stretching back to 1500. An age of globalization in commerce, but also in conquest and empire. We see it starting um, with the Portuguese expeditions to India and the Spanish expeditions to America. We see it starting in 1500, the world then at 500 million people. And it was a poorer world in 1770, but it was not that much poorer. It could not have been. A world of $900 per year per capita income, $2.50 a day, that's a world in which people must spend two-thirds of their resources simply on getting 2,000 calories plus essential nutrients a day. That's a world in which how hard people can work is greatly limited by their biological energy budget. Things like sugar become absolutely key. That's a world in which people find their children's immune systems compromised by mal malnutrition so they can be carried off by the common cold and in which they are stunted so that they are some four inches shorter in height as adults than we are. If the human population had been any poorer than, say, $2.50 a day, spending one fifty a day on bare biological nutritional subsistence, it would not have been able to reproduce itself. But the human population did. Um, so we know wasn't less than $2.50 a day. But the human population grew barely, very, very slowly. Um, so we know it couldn't have been much richer than $900 per year per capita either. So between 1500 and 1770, we guesstimate that our rate of growth of the efficiency of labor is 0.075% per year. We estimate that our rate of growth of population is 0.15% per year. The first plus half the second gives us 0.15% per year for the rate of growth of the ideas stock. You know, one third the pace that the world saw during the British Industrial Revolution century 
and one thirteenth the pace of the modern economic growth century and a half that we are used to. And before 1500, humanity could not have been materially poorer than $2.50 a day, but it could not have been much richer either. In a pre-industrial world with enormous infant mortality, parents are eager for more children in the hope that one at least will survive to carry on the lineage plus care for them in their old age if they have one. We know that a nutritionally unstressed human population without access to artificial means of birth control and without literacy, that such a population quadruples in a century. A natural increase growth rate of 1.5% per year. But when we look back at rates of population growth worldwide, we guess at 0.075% per year from 800 to 1500 and from the year 1 to 800 at 0.112% per year from minus 1,000 to the year 1. At 0.06% per year from year minus 3,000 to minus 1,000 in the Long Bronze Age, starting with the discovery of writing. At 0.025% per year for the 3,000 years before minus 3,000, the pre-writing um, days of Malthusian near subsistence effective stasis at $2.50 a day as a typical standard of living. That's the standard of living of today's bottom billion in our world today. Ferocious infant disease and famine mortality, reducing average rates of population growth to about 2% per generation, that really does appear to have been humanity's lot from the invention of writing and the first stirrings of the Bronze Age in minus 3,000 up to 1,500. Yes, the upper class lived well, and yes, the upper class lived increasingly well, um, but humanity as a whole had a very hard time. That gives us a 3,000, minus 3,000 to 1,500, um, average rate of ideas growth of a hair under 0.04% per year. That's 1 50th, as we have seen, of what we have seen in our day. In our day, in fact, for the past 150 years, we have seen the average two years produce more proportional invention, discovery, and ideas, and economically useful ideas deployment than a typical century before 1500 saw. And we have seen this even though all the truly low-hanging technological and organizational fruit has long been picked. And even though we know so much more that a great deal more discovery and deployment is needed to maintain the same proportional growth rate in the value of the useful ideas stock. That's the huge picture. And I at least I at least see five important watershed crossings in the economic history of the past 5,000 years. The first is the invention of writing about 5,000 years ago. Before then, humans were indeed anthology intelligences in a sense. What one person knew, pretty soon everyone else in the band knew because of our incredible and sometimes regrettable compulsion to talk and gossip even when we know it will not be to our long-term advantage. But even though humans were anthology intelligences within the band, in a sense, knowledge was limited and evanescent. What one band knew had a hard time diffusing over great distances. And what was not immediately useful could and did decay and be lost over the centuries. Once we have writing, however, we are a global time-binding anthology intelligence indeed. And that mattered. That mattered a lot. We can see that mattering a lot in what happened from the year minus 3000 to minus 1. More people chattering and communicating, leading to more advances in ideas, which supported faster population growth, um, 
and because Malthusian forces, which produced a greater human population base, which produced more chattering and communicating, even more advances in ideas, we can see ideas growth gathering strength, gathering speed from after minus 3,000. Growth rates from minus 3,000 to later appear to have been twice what the ideas growth rate before minus 3,000 was, judging by the slow growth of human populations up to the invention of writing. And it looks like the pace of ideas growth doubled again, comparing before minus 1000 to after, um, the coming of the Iron Age, perhaps the Axial Age. But then there comes a second watershed, the late antiquity pause. When we compare before the year one to after, we do not see another doubling. Instead, after 170, things fall apart. Dark Ages, imperial decline and fall, barbarian invasions, emperors desperate to protect their realms making unwise deals with barbarian warlords, with names like Alaric the Visigoth or An Lushan the Sogdian. Rather than a breakthrough out of Malthusian near stagnation, the years from 1 to 1500, in them I see a decline in the idea's growth rate back to 0.035% per year, back to the agrarian age norm. But there is a breakthrough. The breakthrough comes with the third watershed crossing around 1500. The years after 1500 see a tripling um, of the rate, oh, oh, a quadrupling of the rate of ideas growth over the previous agrarian age norm. Then around 1770 comes the fourth watershed crossing, the British Industrial Revolution around 1770, with a tripling of the rate of ideas growth. And then the fifth and final watershed crossing into our modern economic growth era around 1870 sees a further more than quadrupling. What was at stake for humanity in these last three watershed crossings? Well, suppose we had not had the coming of the commercial imperial age after 1500. Suppose the pace of ideas growth had remained at the worldwide average pace it had settled at in the previous seven centuries between then and the defeat of the Anxi Rebellion in China and the crowning of Charlemagne in Italy. Um, there certainly was nothing in history before 1500 to tell you that faster ideas growth is foreordained. In fact, there is this late antiquity pause. What would the world now look like had there not been a commercial imperial revolution to speed up ideas growth or any of the two subsequent watershed crossings? Well, we can do the arithmetic. The world would st have stayed in Malthusian poverty, figure $2.50 a day, as the standard of living of the typical human. Upper class would live better, and upper class would live increasingly better as technology advanced, um, but we're talking typical. Infant mortality and vulnerability to plagues and famines would remain, curbing population growth to an average of 7% per century. Take that as the basis for our arithmetic, and we would say that today's world would then, in this counterfactual, have 730 million people on it, about the population of 1700, with a technology level of roughly that of 1630. Caravels, muskets and pikes, forward-looking agriculturalists would be experimenting with nitrogen fixation to replenish soil quality. It would be a world of gunpowder empires and kingdoms and merchants, in which each century still looked very much like um, the previous one. What would we have had to eliminate from our history in order for there not to have been a commercial imperial revolution around 1500? In order for there not to have been the quadrupling of the pace of ideas growth that we saw as humanity did made that watershed crossing? That is an interesting and deep question. Um, there had been a renaissance. There was about to be a reformation. Um, but there had been efflorescences before. 
And there had been the Axial Age, the Iron Age, the millennium before the year 1, um, or possibly better dated from minus 800 to 170, during which technological progress was twice what it had been before, and at least half again what it was at the agrarian age norm. Particular forms of intellectual curiosity centered around the idea that nature was understandable and mechanical because the spirits were hidden, withdrawn from the world. The widespread distribution of printing as an intellectual progress force multiplier. Societal structures in which merchants and clerics had more and princes and warriors less power. An unusual degree of durable non-family frameworks for societal organization. Laws that constrained the powerful to some extent, rather than just commanding the powerless. And so secured everyone's property so everyone could afford to invest and accumulate. A relatively rich society for an agrarian age as a result of patterns of delayed marriage that had grown up in the aftermath of the depopulation of the Black Death. All of these were things that made the Northwestern European societies that were to be the heart of the commercial imperial revolution advance so made them at least somewhat different than much of the rest of the world. Plus we had the Columbian Exchange, the revolution in biotechnology that came from the transfer of old world crops to the new world and of new world crops back to the old world. All of these have and probably will always have advocates and learned and thoughtful advocates that they were the things that made the difference for the coming of the commercial imperial revolution age. Plus, there is the possibility that um, the set of civilizations that were to call themselves Western civilization later on, that they were uniquely barbarous, that they had patterns of religious trade, conquest, domination, and enslavement that reinforced each other, and that made it both uniquely vicious and also uniquely effective at engrossing resources and commanding people from elsewhere. However, the transition to the commercial imperial age of 1500 to 1770 came about. The pace of ideas growth during it, although four times as fast as the agrarian age norm, um, that pace of growth was still only one-thirteenth of the pace that we have grown used to in our modern economic growth age. Now, the amount of innovation that we have a year, um, it takes, in eight years, we have more relative progress than they had in a century. Um, if there had not been the breakthrough with the coming of the British Industrial Revolution age to an even faster rate of growth, the fourth watershed crossing, um, what would the world look like today if we just had more of the same of the commercial imperial age? And once again, we can do the arithmetic. A commercial imperial age saw 15% um, pace of ideas growth per century. That would allow for a 30% per century pace of population growth, roughly 9% per generation. That would have been sustainable um, in a $2.50 Malthusian world, um, not have been sustainable. The people would have died too frequently. You'd have a slightly higher standard of living. Well, a noticeably higher standard of living. It would really have mattered to the typical person whether their average standard of living on an average day in an average year was $2.50 a day or $3.25 a day or so. That difference would have made for robust, more robust childhood immune systems, for more reliable female ovulation, um, would support a substantial population upward drift, not explosion, but a drift. But that is still a world much too poor to trigger anything like a demographic transition. Mortality would still be much too high for people to count on their children surviving and to even begin to think about how they should try to have fewer children and give more of a leg up in life to those children they did have. Thus, call this um, 
permanently early steampunk world? You know, um, no, I mean, that would have had a population doubling time of 250 years and an ideas value doubling time of 500 years. The today's world would, in this counterfactual, still seem like a much emptier world, 1.4 rather than 7.6 billion. Um, but the technologies around today in this counterfactual, they would have been somewhat steampunk. Um, 250 more years of commercial industrial rate of technology growth from 1770 it would have given us the technologies of 1830 or so, um, but with significant differences. Steam engines and textile machines would in that world have been curiosities, rather than rapidly expanding sectors of investment and technological deployment. Labor, you see, would have been simply been too cheap for it to have been worth anyone's while to invest in improving technologies of steam and automatic machinery to make them truly efficient. Technologies for how to control very cheap labor, on the other hand, would have promised bonanza profits for entrepreneurs. But it is not at all clear to me what form um, such technologies would take. It turns out, however, that the coming of the British Industrial Revolution truly um, was um, of steam power and automatic machinery um, did happen. But um, it was not, I think, not actually decisive for humanity. At least not if one takes the essence of the British Industrial Revolution to have been the speeding up of the rate of ideas growth from 0.5% per year to 4.45% per year. Um, let me tell you what I'm thinking. Suppose the world had kept it at 1770 to 1870 ideas stock value proportional growth of 0.45% per year since. What would the world then look like today? Well, you know, 0.44% per year ideas growth. You know, that's eaten away by 0.88% per year population growth. In that case, farm sizes and resource availability drop as fast as you can figure out how to better farm and better use resources. 0.8% per year, that's 22% population growth per generation. Two typical parents, then of 2.45 children, survive to reproduce. Um, a typical person living on maybe $4.50 a day uh, can manage, their children are well nourished enough to manage that amount of fertility and child survival. But that standard of living and that degree of child survival, it's really not enough to trigger any spontaneous demographic transition on the part of those having the children. Where two children would have survived to grow up and reproduce in a Malthusian age, there are now 2.45, but that does not provide enough security and confidence to lead people to begin thinking about curbing their fertility in order to give a stronger leg up to their surviving children. Hence, it seems to me likely that a world with ideas growth at its British Industrial Revolution age pace, that would head for a stable income level of $4.67 per day or so, of $1,700 per year, much, much more prosperous, almost twice as prosperous as a Malthusian agrarian age society, but still vastly poorer than ours. Such a world in that counterfactual today would have achieved 2.9 billion in terms of the number of people. And the level of technology in such a world today would be about that of 1905. Um, but it would be a poorer world than 1905 because 1905 had only about two-thirds that number of people. Now, would such a growth equilibrium have been stable for the long term? Hmm. I strongly suspect not. Come 2500 at a British Industrial Revolution pace of growth, we would arrive at today's technology. Um, and with a population doubling time of 62 years because of no demographic transition, 
Such a world would in 2500 have a population of 500 billion, 70 billion, 70 people, where there is today one. Agriculture would have to be extremely labor intensive in such a counterfactual, if feeding so many people with our, what we have, technology we have today were possible at all. My bet is that something else would have happened. Early steampunk world looks sustainable as an equilibrium for humanity for centuries or millennia. Gunpowder Empire world looks sustainable for millennia, if not longer. You know, kind of no breakthrough to modern economic growth. Um, I can't see Industrial Revolution era pace. I see it either as generating a breakthrough to modern economic growth or generating a China one policy, one child policy style demographic transition, or a fallback to Malthusian near stagnation rates of, of ideas growth. Um, of course, these are none of them. None of these are the world we live in. Um, we live in a different world. We did have the third watershed, right, the commercial imperial revolution. We do not have a world of gunpowder empires in 1630 era technology with 730 million people, one-tenth their actual human population spread over to the world with a typical standard of living of $2.50 a day. Um, we did have the fourth watershed, the British Industrial Revolution. We do not have early steampunk world of 1.4 billion people, one fifth of our current population living on 325 a day. Um, with 1830s technology, but with a great deal more technological ingenuity devoted to labor control and less devoted to boosting labor productivity via steam power and automatic machinery. And um, we do not have late steampunk 1905 technology. We did have a further acceleration to modern economic growth. We do not have 2.8 billion people living on $4.50 a day or so. Again, with our technology focused more on how the elite can marshal and control cheap workers rather than how to boost productivity of e-machines and power sources. Um, after all, in that world, machines and power sources are expensive and labor is cheap. But we have our world, and I think we have a far better world. We have a world of 7.6 billion people with an income level averaging $12,000 a day. Not $12,000 a year. Not $4.67 and not $3.25 and not $2.50 a day. But rather $30 a day. Why? Um, well, we did have the development of the Industrial Research Lab around 1870 with its routinization and rationalization of invention and innovation. We did have the modern corporation develop with its routinization and rationalization of the deployment of ideas on the ground. We did have globalization as we know it, in transport and communications and in migration to create enormous incentives to go for large scale and its associated economies. We have had American ascendancy North America as, in Russian revolutionary Leon Trotsky's words, the furnace where the future is being forged. We have had for a century and a half, and we have grown used to, ideas growth of 2.1% per year, a doubling time of our technological and organizational competence of 35 years. We have grown used to more change and development in two years proportionately than in a typical agrarian age century. Things have been absolutely, totally wonderful um, for humanity relative to all previous epochs, relative to what would have happened had we managed to miss any of these watershed crossings. On the other hand, um, we have also had extraordinary growth in inequality, not so much within economies. Within economy, inequality looks not that much different than in the past, but between economies. Three to one was about the ratio of richest to poorest world societies 500 or even 250 years ago. 
50 to 1 appears to be that ratio today between, say, Singapore and Ethiopia. Today we have the global north, the quote west, unquote, some 800 million people with more than four times the world's average standard of living. And we have a bottom billion still living on $2.50 a day, albeit with access to modern public health, which is extremely important, and access to some of modern telecommunications. But such great, gross, enormous global inequality across societies, that's unique um, to our age. Still, um, on the whole, um, I don't want to be Pangloss. It's not the best of all possible worlds. But it does seem to be much better than the other reasonably attainable possible worlds we might have wound up in. A great deal was at stake in the three economic history watershed crossings of the past half millennium. Thanks to them, um, although we surely, surely are not there yet, we have the prospect of a truly human world in our future. It is not yet at hand, but it is, I think, from the broad perspective of history, relatively close.